Hey, what's up, guys? This is Lucas. You are listening to the Edge and Flow podcast. I'm sitting here with my co-host, TJ Schwartz, and uh, we're getting ready to start our Monday conversation because we missed an episode. What's up, TJ? Yeah, it may not seem like we missed one to these guys because we usually post it a few days later, but... I know. Between you and I, we we missed one. We were a couple <laughs> days late, but it was because your young man had a birthday. Yeah, six years old. Yep, yeah, and then I was kind of busy tied up the next day so oh, good. here we are on we're Monday. building in redundancy yeah. we have yeah. we we have at first we were like recording these and releasing them within a day yeah and then you had the very wise idea to put a, a little gap in there so it's good it's helped. redundancy it's helped us so far ties into our question um what we're going to talk about today which is super fun because i have been jonesing for like listener questions Mm -hmm. Um, so this one ties in, we met David from Dishonored Blade Works, uh, in Atlanta and had a really nice, uh, conversation with him and his, uh, girlfriend, um, at their table. Mm -hmm. He sent in a question and basically, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, but the, the question was, what does success look like for a knife maker? But go into some detail around that. Yeah. So, so David asks, What does, or what is success as a knife maker? And he wanted to mention what, like divide this into the two main categories of being a hobbyist or full-time. And maybe if there's marker differences between those, and then there's things that matter more, uh, whether you're full-time or part-time as it pertains to success. Yep. And I thought that was a very interesting question and very top of mind for me too, just kind of looking forward with, sort of a growth and change uh, pace right now that's really fast. I've been trying to think a lot about this. And so let's dig into it, man. All right. Well, so I actually think, I think this is going to become a two part because I've got a lot of ideas (laughs) around like, you know, what, what success is, I think, as do you, um, it's tying in pretty closely with, with some, current situations. My current situation is actually that I have made some mistakes and I am feeling like I am in over my head. So I was thinking it could be fun to kind of like dig into that a little bit because I think in a way it like ties into what it is to be successful. Also, Mm -hmm. um, you want to hear my problem? I do. I just took on too much, Mm -hmm. like way too much. Um, I'm feeling super scattered right now. So beginning of the year, I, I made the decision that I wanted to focus on some brand collaboration work. Um, it's really easy for me to get hyper focused on a concept. And so branding in for me is like serves like a similar satisfaction point as making, but it is very, very different. Um, in that as you were branding and, and as you were doing like certain types of products and projects, they scale very quickly. Um, and not all of them scale profitably, right? Mm -hmm. So basically where I'm at right now is trying to figure out how to un, (laughs) un F myself, uh, and it's hard, man. So mm-hmm. I right now, like this month, I have not been feeling like a successful maker. Mm. So you're keying in on like the sensation. Do you think that's a big part of it? And like the internal factors? Yeah, I, I really do. Um, I think the scales are unbalanced. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's a lot that we do that is not purely the bottom line, um, I think, or we wouldn't be doing what we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. So the way this has happened to me like numerous times over the years and in like a certain way, I kind of welcome it um, because it makes it makes you stop and look at all systems. And so basically I had like a come to Jesus call with my accountant because I'm like, I'm spending money super fast. I was like, but we're making money. Mm hmm where like, I was like, where's the imbalance? Like, I'm, I feel like I'm losing, like I'm losing part of like the tracking ability. Right. 
she had some very interesting feedback for me, which is she's like, you're basically, she's like, you're focusing on small things too much at the cost, basically like jumping over dollars to pick up dimes. I got so wrapped up in the idea of like these fun, smaller projects and like apparel and patches and, and just like, like merch ish things that the work around them scaled past their profitability. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not to say that they're not profitable. It's that when you look at a business, the size of ours and like it's Maddie and myself, the scale has grown past the point where these types of projects make sense for Maddie and I to handle. Mm -hmm. Because it's this little, it's just like little micromanaging conversations and, and project management that really requires someone in that position. But that position right now and the product supporting it, probably there's probably an imbalance there. So like we're not doing enough like merch brand, like project stuff to actually hire someone to fully do that job. And yet my time is still better off spent somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These realizations, it's like stopping a boat because there's projects in the works. There's uh, conversations that need to be finished and there's money that needs to be spent. And so kind of where, where I'm at right now is like the stop banging your head against the wall point. Like first step, just mm -hmm. stop. So basically right now, um, I'm kind of in this process of refocusing and looking at every project, every relationship and figuring out like what is adding value, what is creating bottlenecks. Um, and it's hard, man. Cause I'm like emotionally attached to some of the projects. Right. Yeah. So this is, it's funny because like I was, we were like talking about this question and I was like, man, if I start just going into like what success for a knife maker looks like, it would feel super disingenuous because I'm like literally, like, you know, like yeah. sweating right now and just feeling like overloaded. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing all that, man. Like, and I can, I can relate to some, some aspects of that right now. I mean, it's, it's always a roller coaster. You know what I mean? There's always more workload, less workload, more profitability, less profitability. You know, it's just kind of the age old thing of, of running a business. And yeah, like the, I would say like a month ago when we first hired the first employee, I, I told my wife, I said, it's probably going to be two months of like, not fun. Like yeah. I told her, like, it's, it's probably going to be that. And it, there's parts of it. Like we're going like the shop's moving great. Everything's doing well, but there's some definite not fun factors right now. Um, and so I can definitely relate to that. And so it's, uh, it's, it's good to, good that you're sharing this. And like, I'm, I'm happy that that we're having a raw conversation and that some people can listen to it. Dude, with um, social media, like everything is positive, man. Yeah. All you see, all yeah. you see are wins and like, it's not, it's not reality. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's, I think that there is a lot of value in maybe it's not, not seeing it constantly, but just realizing that like at every level there are, there are issues. Mm -hmm. The beauty, the beauty of a lot of it is when you are trying to change things. Right. And you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Th that's why there's all of these adages. I feel like around these concepts, right? Sometimes you literally, you have to try it, you test it out and then you pull back or, or it works and you, you know, you kind of like take what you want and, and move forward. Um, for us, the last, like, I mean, really the last six years have been like just so much change over that, like two cross country moves, two kids, like all of these things and learning how to learning how to work within those environments, like, uh, having different like financial needs, all of these things. And so figuring out where to change things can be incredibly difficult because you're not changing like a single item, right? Not like, oh, I'm going to modify this, which in a lot of cases is probably like the more scientific, like better way to do it. That's never been how like my brain works though. Yeah. Right. I yeah. get, I'm like, I'm going to change a bunch of stuff. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like an, it's an interesting, it's an interesting place to be because I realize like ultimately I have not been focusing on the areas that like fill me as a maker and probably focus like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to phrase it. Right. But like essentially letting go of certain controls for ease, Mm -hmm. right? There is an ease of being able to purchase product to sell. And there's a, there's a lot of value to it too, because I mean, like when you look at what we are, like being able to sell a t-shirt or hat or being able to do like brand collaborations, like there, there's a lot of crossover. There's a lot of value, but it's about, I guess, like the quantity and how much you can focus. Like Mm -hmm. it is not an accident that I only actively design for two knife companies. Right. Like I learned that lesson very early on, which was I cannot focus efficiently on more companies than that. Like I can't give them what they need and I don't feel like I'm, I'm like the most valuable version of myself. Yeah. Yeah. Doing that inside your own brand can be a really hard thing to actually figure out. One, one thing, maybe it's along those lines that I've been noticing is like if you watch bigger brands and really cool brands that you like and you kind of see it at like the fullness of what they're offering and you see, yep. oh, they've got their knives or whatever yep. it is. They got shirts like yep. look at the website, look at, you know, the booth they have at that trade show. And you kind of it's easy to, to lean into being like, I need to look like that because that, yeah. that appears to be the state of the art. That appears to be what I want. But you have to temper that expectation if you're going to look at what they have and say, well, they have they have a guy who runs the creative department who doesn't yep. touch the product, but they're looking at brand all day and yep. merch. They have people who are engineers. You know what I mean? They, they have more people than what you and I have. And so you have to be careful about aspiring towards something that requires a level of manpower that you're not, you don't either have, or you don't eventually want to have. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? And so that's, I can, maybe that's part of what, what you're feeling is like 100%. wanting, wanting to look like a bigger brand than yep. what you really are. Well, and it's, it's not, I don't know that it's about like look or appearance. I think mm-hmm. it's about providing f- and, and what I'm interested in. So mm-hmm. when I look at brands that I'm interested in, I'm like, they do this and that is rad. Mm-hmm. Right. But, <laughs> and it's, and it's a big, but like the manpower behind it and the, con- it's conversations, right? So like, even if you even just look at graphic design, the conversations around graphic design, if you are producing product are, are not inconsequential. And so I actually, I really enjoy it. It's a, it's something it, that is one of those, that is one of those components of kind of the more product oriented side that I, that I get true value from because I like working with creative people. The same is also true for like brand collaborations. And like, luckily like this year, the brand collaborations I've done, I'm really happy with, but what I realize is I don't want to keep adding them. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and we've had like, we've had like some bangers, right? Like for sure. The pen with tactile, the ring with, with good art. Like these are companies that like I like and I respect and I enjoy the conversations with, but I still see like, okay, those are, those are still, they still take real time. And so that was kind of like, I realized like for a while I was like starting to move towards a few more and I was like, I, I can't do it. Like I can't, I can't spend more time in this area. So man, it's a, it's such an interesting balance point. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think I had another, like an epiphany recently, which was like, I've been pushing hard again for like growth, but without a specific goal. Um, and more importantly than a goal. And I think this is going to tie into something that you are dealing with a little bit, right. Which is like these like semi nebulous goals where you're like, you're starting to have capacity and resources that you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a huge difference between having goals 
and identifying values. I think it's probably one of the single biggest determining factors of like what I would consider success at this point. Like, and I'm learning this in retrospect because I think that the majority thing, the majority of (laughs) things that I somehow considered values over the last decade may have actually just been goals. And when you complete a goal, there's another goal. Mm -hmm. If you're living inside of a value structure, you're actually identifying if the goals fit inside of a value. Mm -hmm. So, so elaborate on values, like talk about that. I mean, like the easiest, the easiest, I guess, frame of reference for value would be like, if you're to say like, like, okay, what do you, what do you value most in your life? Let me ask you that. What is it? Uh, family. I mean, okay. take, yeah. Right. So 100% yeah. you're going to put family first. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is, <laughs> this is like kind of a convergence of like streams. I didn't think about the conversation going here, but, uh, recently heard someone say, so what? And I, uh, it's on another podcast and I absolutely loved it. So like when you look at family, if you're like family is my priority and I say, so what? So what are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. Right. You can identify a bunch of, of things that you are actually doing that support the fact that family is your number one priority. Right. Okay. But as you go down the line, that's going to get muddier. I guarantee it. Yeah. Because you're gonna be like, this is important. And you'll be like, so what are you doing about it? And be like, nothing. Yeah. Like, like, you know, yeah. so it's been this like ongoing process, I think of gr- like trial and error growth, missing, missing some cues of like, maybe that things weren't working the way that I wanted to. And then getting real deep in a hole and having like a wake up moment and then, you know, backing out. Yeah. 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 Okay? where this I think really ties into a success conversation, which is going to be the whole, a whole separate pod is actually having the ability to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's a few ways that you can have mistakes. You can either have, uh, it doesn't matter because there's no stakes. Like you, you know, you're not dependent on this for your income or you can, make mistakes that are within your ability to correct. But if you exist, if you are working, okay. And you can't afford to take risks or make mistakes. To me, that is like a marker that you are not feeling successful. Yeah. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. It's like, there has to be enough padding in the structure of your organization of your workflow of all that that experimentation failure that that's like it's like a line item almost you know what i mean it's like an expense it's like i'm gonna scrap this many blades every once in a while it's just gonna happen i'm gonna have a bad design that no one likes it's gonna happen i'm gonna buy merch that no one buys i'm you know like something's gonna happen and that's i'm gonna have to eat that and it may not just be like from a monetary standpoint but it could just be like time and focus Yep. You, you went down a rabbit hole for this long and you have enough time in your system to be able to pivot. Um, well, and, and I, that, that, that like kind of ties in. So a lot of the projects that I'm looking at, like when you look at bottom line, they're profitable. Okay. If you look at, if you look at certain elements of your business as almost like investment mm-hmm. where you say like, all right, I'm going to return a 30%. I'm going to get a 30% margin on this. Well, if I give you a dollar and you give me a dollar 30 and we just do that forever, it works out great for me. Okay. It's not huge margin, but it's consistent. Okay. So where this broke down for us was in the unseen costs. So right now, like for us to do a big drop, like we did a huge drop today. Okay. Uh, the majority of the product is shipping from our fulfillment center. Okay. We pay a fixed rate for a product to ship that cuts into a margin that it is existing. And if it's an inexpensive product with a high margin, it just starts to not, the profit is not there. It's not that it's not profitable. Mm -hmm. It's that it's not making enough money to justify 
like the setup time and the media and the newsletters and the conversations. And like, it's a weird thing to realize. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I don't know that I ever would have realized it until we pushed it to this point. Yeah. Because otherwise it's almost, it's just like, it's, it's on the flip side, like the margin of it, not loss, but like, so maybe that, maybe that 30% is now like 15 or 20%. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you, you finish like a big drop and you're like, how's actually like a lot of work. And you look and you're like, that's the, that's like the total end profit. You're like, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it took it to be a big enough number to notice it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also easy to put up like a spreadsheet or run some, yeah. you know, every business owner, you pull out your phone, you start calculating stuff Yeah, and you start, you're like, okay, if I did a hundred, if I did 200, 300 yep. and you start looking at the numbers yep. and you're like, oh yeah, that many, that's where, that's where I'd like that amount of money. Yeah. But then you get into it and you're like, when you're calculating that, like I need to do three, 400 of these before that number becomes attractive or interesting. Yeah now you're shipping three, 400 items and you get into it and you're like, now that number maybe isn't as interesting and attractive anymore. Yeah. So it's easy to think like, well, I'll just sell more of them and yep. they'll be priced aggressively or they will be a cheaper item. Um, yeah, that's tough. I, I, uh, one really wise thing I heard, uh, I may have met, mentioned it on the podcast before, but it actually, uh, David from dishonor blade works asked me the same question that I asked Tom Balding. And I told, David, the same answer that Tom Balding told me. Tom is the bit and spur king. He's like yeah. the Chris Reeve of bit and spurs. Yep. And uh, Tom told me, he said, because he said people always ask him about pricing because that's the big question. And Tom said, I'm making sure I phrase it exactly right. He said, I, I charge enough so that I want to do it. And that's how I know it's enough. And that's like night. That's like old school knife maker logic too. Yeah. Right. And I think part of what I gathered from that over the years at the time I was young and I wasn't, didn't fully sink in, but I think part of it is like, okay, we're all hopefully trying to do something that we want to do in the first place, money aside. I mean, we're doing this because we like knives and we like this industry, but when there's those moments where you're really in the work, if the money is not enough for you to want to do it, like you need the money to be enough to where the gaps, where you get a little tired, where you get a little rundown. It's like, you look at the money, like, okay, this is, this is why I'm doing it. I'm feeding the family. We're paying the yeah. mortgage. It's going to be the glue that like keeps you going. And then you'll like fall back in love with it. Maybe, you know, it's yeah. like that undulation. Yep. And it's like, but if those moments come where you look at it and you're like, this isn't enough money for me to want to do it. The odds of climbing out of that and get and falling back in love with it. Yeah. Are not good. Are low. Know? Well, and that's a lot of what I've done this year. I mean, this is, this is around creating like passive or passive or close to passive income, right? That to me is huge for success as a maker. Um, but there's variations on how that works. And basically like looking at it, you know, uh, my accountant was just looking at, it, she's like, she's like, literally, if you focus on your factory collaboration <laughs> and your, and like these three products, she's like your margins are enough that like you're covering the same like profit range. Yeah. Yeah. And she's like, does that feel good to, to not have to think about all these other projects? And it's, this is, this is shades because ultimately like with, with small things, one of the reasons that I've always done them is to give access to the brand and they're Mm -hmm. fun. Right. Um, but there's, I think there's a balance point. So we've been kind of just like churning. And I think what it looks like for us is I still do these, but we do them in a more calculated way. So like I might start working towards three or four merch drops a year or like we run apparel, but we run it, we run it three times a year and that's it, you know, Mm -hmm. um, haven't really figured out the, the process yet. All I know is that what we are doing will change. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a very timely thing because I'm looking at ordering shirts and hats soon. Nice. Uh, I almost wonder if one of the ways to lower the mental burden is like, once you have them designed and you have the idea, Yep. I know it may have less desirability on the customer side, but if you did like a pre-order. Yep. And which we've done. And especially because shirts with the sizing, you almost have to, I'm going to open a pre-order for a for two weeks. Yep. And then I'm just going to order the shirts and then I'm just going to ship them. 
Yep. And then, and then there's, cause I think the inventory management and like the fulfillment and it yep. being constant yep. is what is kind of like breaking and yep. stressful it's the drag. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's kind of how I've thought about approaching it is like, just do like, like you're saying a seasonal release, Yep. you know, for Q1, like it's just the shirt design. You got yep. a couple of weeks to order it. We're going to ship it in, a, you know, six weeks or a month or however yep. long it takes. Um, just to lower the demand on the decision making yep. that is required. Um, that's well, your model, your model is different too than mine in that you have product on your website available. Mm -hmm. Historically, we did not like mm -hmm. we load things. They, and then we sell through, then we rebuild. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like we did. So high techs is a great example, like collab, super great tie in. Um, we, we did a hundred piece high techs chip run today with our other, with the other things in our drop, the chips lasted, I think 30 seconds. And you look at that and you're like, that's, that's like the way my brain works. Right. Mm -hmm. So having these other products was always a way for someone to be like, ah, oh, I missed it, but I'm, I can still like grab this or like, there's a cool mm -hmm. patch. I think, I think that where you are at work wise, it might be less like less overall critical right? To, I don't think you're going to get to a feeling where you're like, man, okay, I don't have a big run of this coming out for another month, like in-house product. So I'm going to focus on getting like these like smaller items up. You're going to be able to like, you probably have a couple items that are just in stock hats, maybe a patch. And then you do apparel run a couple times a year, or like shirts mm -hmm. a couple times mm -hmm. a year, right? Mm -hmm. That might be enough. What's interesting is I would say that like where David is at, is kind of a similar process because of, I think he's like more a disciple of like your school of knife making than mine. Super interesting. Um, the, the conversations that we had with them just to like give them like a minor plug. So, um, Sabelle and David, so David is dishonored blade works. And then, um, Sabelle is Sabelli on Instagram. Something she's, like she's, that. Yeah. yeah. She's like, mm -hmm. If you hear this, forgive me for not knowing. I actually don't have my phone on me. Um, she's a super talented glass artist. He's in like design and CNC world. She is in like hyper creative glass hand, blowing, glass blowing yeah. world. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very cool to see. And their, their, their work is just so kind of different. Yeah. Right. But I think they both have like a very good idea of like what creative fields look like at both a high level and like a, a successful level. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like I, I would actually like to talk to David and like get some more like backstory on like what, what he's looking at goal wise. Right? Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, I'm trying to think also of ways to, compress what I'm thinking and feeling as far as the success question yeah. uh, into like maybe a, a sentence or two. And a, like you touched on, I think goals obviously matter. It depends on what you're trying to do. If you're right. a full timer, I think building a business that allows you to continue to want to do it, which touches on what I said about the sure. pricing, but a structure that is not going to burn you out that is allowing you to survive and more than survive, like to thrive. Yeah. There's no, that yeah. survival should not yeah. be sh survival should yeah. not be even in the thought process. That's exactly right. That's true. right. Yeah. I think a system that's not burning you out, that's allowing you to thrive and your family and whoever you're supporting. Yeah. That's success to me. Yep. Um, the markers I would say are that you're not, you know, you're arriving at your destination and you're still alive. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like you're well, not on this. I think, I think like next episode, I think we can get into this in like probably some pretty good detail. Like, like he had asked around, like, what is it for hobbyists? And the beauty of our industry is there's so many different bolt holes. Mm -hmm. You can find a place that you fit that I, I just don't think a lot of industries allow for. Mm -hmm. Um, but man, yeah, I don't know. This is, this year has been, has been pretty interesting. Like the last couple of weeks I was, I was like really beating myself up and 
I'm, I'm out of it now because at the end of the day, what I realized is like, I tried, I tried to make improvements. I missed some kind of critical data midpoint, but I still caught it. Right. Um, and I, and I can adjust. It just takes, it's like, it takes energy. Mm -hmm. And that is like the most, that's like the most frustrating thing is realizing like, I'm still trying to figure out how to like work effectively, like, and be a good dad, Mm -hmm. you know, cause I want to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. That's like what I've done for a long time. And I like it, Yeah, but I don't want to do it because it doesn't fit in my value structure. So I might, I might have a goal of, you know, a bunch of new designs, but when I look at it, from a time standpoint, I realized that it doesn't fit inside of that value structure because what it would cost, um, in over a short a certain timeline. Um, mm-hmm. so I feel like if you had asked me, <laughs> if you had asked me six years ago, definitely what success was for a maker, I would have given you a very different answer now. The reality, I think, of the goal-based success platform is that by any metric that I could imagine, I would look at exactly where I'm at now then and be like, that right there, that's successful. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in it right now, I realized some things were like off kilter Mm -hmm. because I don't think I set the, I don't think I set up the goals to fit inside of values. Yeah. It's a weird thing. That's right? interesting. Yeah. yeah. Goals are like, I feel like it's more like a hedonic treadmill. Yeah. Like you hit it and then you're like, yeah, I can do a little more. Yeah. Or like that's why they always say like keeping up with the Joneses like doesn't work because like, you know, as a, as a metaphor, cause you're like, oh, they, they got a new car. So you get a new car. Yeah. But then in another year they get a new car. So it's like, it's a moving target. Right. Yep. Or if you are in a position where you're like, all right, I did that. The Joneses, but then there's the Smiths. Yeah. You just move it over. There's always that one guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Mm -hmm. as makers, this can be like a similar. So like last year I bought a huge amount of forging equipment. I was psyched. Mm -hmm. I haven't used it. It was a mistake. It was a mistake in the sense that I overestimated my current time to utilize it. Now I was able to cover like, or recover from that, like financial error. But when I look at it, I'm like, what was I, what was I thinking? Like, I'm still interested and I'm still like messing around and still forging. But I realized that like the, the game versus the gain at that point wasn't there. Like I didn't have enough time to, to focus on forging right now to warrant the amount of equipment that I purchased. And so that's one of these areas right now that I'm really looking at and being like, okay, this is a stop. Mm -hmm. I have everything in my shop that I need currently to produce the work that I want to produce. It's super easy to like, for me to always be looking for like the next thing. Same. Okay. Yeah. That basically I'm putting on full hold until minimum the end of the year. Right. Just, I just like was sitting there on my bench and I'm like, dude, like right now, like everything is in place to be as content and as happy as a maker as I can possibly be. That's the reality of it. I have my health. My family has their health. We have a home. We have a shop. I can spend time with my kids. I'm like, what is it? Like, where is this weird secondary drive coming from? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just, I think it is just that like desire for motion. Uh everything you're saying is like really resonating with me right now. Mm -hmm. Um, like big time because it's, I feel like, so like full transparency, like this month is a record month for us. Launched a new model, bunch of cool stuff happening, lots of knives selling, but I have the same sensation that you're feeling where it's like, (laughs) I don't know, like, could we, I mean, we could push a little more. And then there's also the feeling of like, okay, now I need to replicate this every month. Like that's like in my head, you know, and I keep, I keep thinking about that. And I'm like, well, that would mean, you know, a little more capacity here, more there. And I I look and it's like, since I bought the Tormach, 
two and a half years ago, it's kind of been that like the yeah. whole time, like kind of pushing on the accelerator just a little bit more. And it's yep. like, as soon as I can get another inch, I'm going to take two inches. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then it's like, it's gotten me really far in two and a half years as to what's happened. But that growth for the sake of growth conversation is kicking in. Like you said, where I look at my shop and I'm like, I can make all this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have the manpower now with Dalton. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I should be good. And I have yeah. to remind myself cause I've said that before. And then like in a month or two, something is nagging in the shop. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, I just, I need more tool holders. Like that's really all I need, you know, and it, it just can continue to go, go, go. Like you can continue to write checks to make your shop, yeah not even more productive, but just like a little more comfortable, a yeah. little nicer, a little, little more, whatever. Um, and I think looking at the bottom line of like what we're actually putting into our household is like taking care of the family and stuff we're taking care of totally. But it's like, if, if a good percentage of the money that could be taking care of my family, even better is like buying even more resources to then make more knives to then buy more tools. Like, yep. It's, I'm definitely looking at it with a pretty zoom lens right now. So yeah. like you're resonating with me a lot. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's another component of this, which is like, we are in a very <clears throat> like hustle culture, mm -hmm. not knife making specifically, but just like age group and like being in the United States, like hustle is the thing. Mm -hmm. I remember like, in my twenties, I started to have this feeling people would ask like, how are you? And I'd be like, I'm getting busy. And I started to realize that I didn't consider busy to be successful. And I'm like, I still sometimes say I'm busy, but I try not to because I realize like that is not just being busy is not a goal. Busy to me mm -hmm. is like inefficiency. Yeah. Right. You're like, you're harried like, Oh, life's good. Is it good or is it busy? Yeah. Not that it can't be both, but I just think that's like a marker. Yeah. You know, I think that there's probably, <laughs> there's probably a different type of opportunity that is afforded by slowing down and like just doing the work in front of you. So let me give this as an example. Uh, we've talked a bunch about like my continued like, you know, trials at like learning more CAD cam and becoming like a better machinist. A lot of times I'm using time to learn, but I'm not finishing product. And so over the last couple months, I've just started allowing myself to work by hand when I want to finish product, like projects that are already started in the shop. And I've noticed like two things. I'm like, well, there's knives in the drawer. And I'm feeling really satisfied with my work. Mm -hmm. So the concept of like pushing for efficiency's sake was actually just stopping me from like building things that I can sell for money and mm -hmm. enjoying the act of building. Them. Mm -hmm. That's weird. Now, yeah. if I just stayed there, I wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be content. But what I realized is like for a while, it was just all push all the time. And so I think you actually, in that way, I think you start to miss opportunities and miss value that you've already created in other areas. Mm -hmm. And so, man, it's like, a, it's like a strange thing to just look at it and be like, oh, like slowing down is an efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. And, right? and having the, the, the machine of your business be able to run at a slow rate, you know what I mean? Cause it. If, exactly. Like one thing I'm afraid of is if I build my business to where it's like high octane, yeah. fast, but it has to run that way or it goes upside down. You know what I mean? Because it's right. like it's possible to build it that way. And I can see I could make decisions right now that would make it that way. And yeah. that makes me nervous. Yeah. And so I'm like, I'm contemplating that a lot. Like you and I have had conversations about I look at my capacity, the shop capacity that I yeah. have. I'm like, if the, if the, if the business requires me to sell our entire capacity in order to make it yeah, in order to, you know, hit payroll, take care yep. of the family, do all the things, then that's probably bad because right. it's like, I don't want to be targeting full capacity. Right. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is that capacity that what's, and I, 
I really dove into it. Like I made a spreadsheet where I put, because of part of the, the variables here is like, if I sell direct to customer versus to a retailer, the margins are very different. Right. Um, and it may be only 30% different off the top, but it's actually a way bigger than 30% difference on like the net. And so I, I made a spreadsheet of like each model. And then I put like the cost or the, the profit if it sells direct to customer and the profit if it goes to a retailer for each yep. model. And then I started typing in numbers like, okay, in the right hand side, I can see like the monthly value of like actual profit. And I would type in like, okay, if I sold X amount of these to of the Overland direct X amount to retailer, and I was just playing with the numbers. Because I was like, where is a happy place? You know, what I mean, where's the happy right. place of volume? Um, and it's that is probably the biggest thing in front of me right now to like get nailed down is I think that's a good way to look at it though, is like using like a horsepower, or like, you know, analogy from a business standpoint. Right. And, and this, I guess like mileage may vary here too. Like I'm sure there's, I know there's people that are like hard chargers that just want to go and they need like, they need that mm -hmm. energy and stress to like function. Yeah. I, have would identify myself with that for a lot of years. And I don't actually think it was the right choice. I just think yeah. it was like, that was a survival mechanism, but like, yeah. Do you feel like red redlining your, you know, Honda civic and you know, someone like blows by you and you know, third gear. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, it's like, that's... what's the, what's the, which business do you want to be? And, and it, it, the, the metaphor holds up because it's like I, I want my business to be like a diesel engine, like a diesel yeah. generator sits yeah. there at like 1800 RPM yep. and it just runs. Yeah, that's like what I want, because like you said, if it's if it requires high RPM, it's like yeah. pulling a trailer. You want a diesel because it's yeah. going to run a low RPM. Yeah. So I think that yeah. I mean, it, I also just think at scale like it makes sense. There's there's another component of this, too, which is we have a bias that is going to tell us that things are going to work. So you're like, well, yeah, I can like, I can like take this on. Um, and I can, you know, this will be fine. You're fine until, and that, that until is a really good thought exercise of asking yourself what need, what would change about a situation for it to not work. Mm -hmm. Um, again, so here, here would be like a great example. Uh, we've got a family vacation coming up. I was getting, I was going to do a show at the end of the month. Um, PNWCI really fun show. Um, the timeline was tight. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, my dad called, he's turning 84 this month. And he was like, Hey, uh, I'm ready to come live with you guys. I need to be in your family. That happens in August. Okay. The way that I was working for the show, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So one thing got added, one deadline got added. And what it, what it is, it's like either I, I destroy like a family vacation or I remove a major financial benefit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, okay. So I, I pull the show, right. Frustrating, but like, mm -hmm. what's the, what's that first value, right? It's like family. So mm -hmm. family, family, my dad, and family, my kids. Mm -hmm. But there is a way that I could have been, if the work had been done for that show with more of a timeline, it would have been less of a problem. And that just, that carries through a lot of these kind of conversations because I think that makers in general have this feeling like you, we can make money. So you're, you're like, I can always make more money. I can mm -hmm. make more product. Well, you can until you can't, until something mm -hmm. happens. And so yeah. that I think carrying into like the next conversation about like what success is plays like a major role. Yeah. yeah. Right. For sure. No, absolutely. And I can say, dude, you should be proud that like you can take care of your dad like that. Holy that is, cow. That's like that's a position you've put yourself in that is something you should be proud of for sure. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, it's like a lot to process. Yeah. Um, but it definitely feels like the right decision. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm psyched because like the boys are both at an age where I think they're really going to benefit from mm -hmm. spending time with my dad. Like he's 
so much of who I am is, I think, directly related to him, but he is so different from me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that having that kind of like, I don't know, just that that's like the, probably the benefit of multi-generational housing, like in general. Um, I think for Bo, it's going to be really cool. My dad's like great musician, great artist, great storyteller. Mm -hmm. And that like is like where Bo is kind of, we're seeing like, I don't know, his interests lie, Mm -hmm. speaks five languages. Like, so if I can have the kids hang out with my dad, my dad gets value, they get value. Like I'll get, I'll get time with him. Like it's good, but that's good. It's, it's, it's It's a a lot lot to process, man. It's a lot. No, I can imagine. (laughs) So, I mean, that's like success. I think in general is like, it's like asking, it's like wealth versus versus riches. I don't Mm -hmm. know if that's going to track, but like I would rather be wealthy than rich. Yeah. And maybe it's just the way that I perceive the term, but like wealth seems like more of like a holistic, like overview. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's not just based purely on numbers. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a comfort vector in wealth. Yeah. And like satisfaction, you can be very rich and be very uncomfortable or very unhappy. Yeah. Very yeah. Unhappy. Maybe I don't, I don't yeah. know. And maybe that yeah. is, is just like semantics, but yeah. in my head, that's the way that I have, uh, I've like aligned it. Mm-hmm. And I realized that like, I want to live a wealthy life, but that means like health, <laughs> that means creativity, that means freedom, that yeah. means, you know, love. There's all of these other things that are like tied in there. Yeah. So I think that from the value proposition, I think that no one told me that as a new maker. Yeah. Clearly define your values and fit your goals inside of those. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, I think a lot of people spend time chasing goals that don't fit their values. And I think that, I think there's a lot of unhappy people because of that. Yeah. And it it is weird how that can, how you can have goals that don't align with values and not realize it. Yeah. Because that, the way you said that does make me think a lot about it and like, it's a different way to put it, you know, goals and values being two different things yeah. until you force them to be the same yeah, or be an internal to each other or whatever. Yeah. I think it's just like, it's like, like Russian nesting dolls. Like, you know, the biggest doll has to be the value. Yeah. Everything else goes inside of that. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's interesting. Like it is a, it's moving ongoing process. I'm, Right now I'm feeling like super grateful that I caught, I caught this process kind of like at what feels like a pretty early stage. Cause I definitely mm. could have kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And like, this even ties in with like doing OEM knives for Burnley brand. Like I really enjoy doing them and I enjoy having them. Some of like the numbers and the way that I was doing it. I think are, are not a fit. So a lot of times I think there's, it's like the yes. And scenario where you're like, yeah, I do want to do it. And I also need to change it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think there's modifications as opposed to like full, like, you know, kill it. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's much that I'm going to (laughs) kill there. I, but from a brand standpoint, I feel like we're going to like, step back, slow down, reevaluate, mm-hmm. and then modify. That's, that's wise. And, and I look forward to hearing like kind of through that journey, kind of updating, pivoting and seeing how, how it goes. Dude, I can see it's a little bit of a tangent, but one thing that happened this weekend that, like I said, it's the last couple of months has been like kind of a high octane, kind of stressful, kind of like just rapid, rapid change growth, all just all the things that feel like they need managed right mm-hmm. now. Um, and I, I picked up this POS six by six ATV <laughs> and, uh, what is the, it called? It's called a max ATV, yeah. same, similar to like an Argo. Yep. And you'll get why I'm telling you this, but like I, uh, my brother-in-law saw it on the side of the road, 250 bucks. They're incredibly rare. I've wanted one since I was like eight, but I have never seen one with my own two eyes in real life. And he's, he's like, dude, there's one on the side of the road, 250 bucks. I'm like. I'm going to go get it yeah. and I'm, I'm going to bring it home. 
it's been a goal <laughs> since I was a kid. And so it's a giant hunk of junk, like doesn't have an engine. But this weekend was the first weekend I spent three hours just like starting to take it apart. And I realized working on something like that where there is literally no pressure. Yeah. Felt so good because it's yeah. like, I really enjoy working in the shop, but there is pressure. Like, yeah. the, you know, the things I'm doing have to have to work. You know right. what I mean? Like if I don't get it working tonight, it's the first thing I'm going to do in the morning because it needs right. to work. Yeah. Whereas this thing, I was kind of like, I don't know what I'll get done. I'm going to start taking it apart and yeah. maybe it'll just be in a lot of parts at the end of the day. And I won't know anything other than that. But I, I felt really good when I was turning wrenches on that thing. And I didn't realize that I needed that. And so that's, that was one discovery I made that it was like, just because you're doing something for work that is fulfilling, doesn't mean you shouldn't also do something similar that has less pressure involved. Yeah. You know, Dude, like, I've, like, I've realized I can't work my way out of stress. Yeah. Yeah. Not in the, not in the short term. If I'm mm. like feeling stressed out, if I'm feeling anxious about something th- working late or, or putting in an extra mm-hmm. day, it actually doesn't fix it. Not for me, mm-hmm. like separating, coming back to it. Like, Sometimes the work just needs done. Like I get that, but Mm -hmm. it, but when I'm like really feeling like anxious or like I didn't get enough done, doing a little more, isn't going to fix it. Those projects, it's like self care for the maker almost. Yeah. 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 It's pretty good. I, I, uh, for the last couple of days, I've been building a greenhouse for Maddie and this morning I was putting down a foundation for it. And I had this moment where I was like, ah, man, I need to be in the shop. And I was like, what are you even saying? Mm-hmm. Like you're doing, you're building a project that is like, it brings joy to Maddie. But in that she's growing vegetables for our family. And I'm looking, I'm like, I'm doing work in service of my family. Mm-hmm. And it instantly, I just felt good. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, it's framing, right. dude. It's, 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 it's framing. framing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think that's something we can go into next time too, which is perspective and how you frame your situation, I think has a lot more to do with success than most people, uh, kind of admit. Well, if you have bad framing, there is no success. Yeah. Because you could take the perfect situation and you frame it badly and you're not successful. Yep. So it's like a lot of people like that. So sometimes success is framing. That's all success is because you can meet very, you know, people that believe that feel successful as human beings that from the outside, maybe not wouldn't look successful from like a Western point of view, but they're, they're good at framing, you know? Yep. So that's pretty good. Yeah. All right. So we kind of got in the weeds on that one a little bit. Um, but I just felt like I I had to like, at least mention it just because it's like, I don't want to go into a conversation and just like everything is roses. Like Mm -hmm. it's easy. Like, it's yeah. easy to make mistakes. It's easy to dig holes. Yep. You just try to get out of them. Yep. Right. First rule is to stop digging. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stand up straight. Get the kink yeah. out of your neck. Look yeah. around. Yep. Yeah. Um, should we call it, man? Uh, I, I wanted to throw one little side note. Lay it out. I ordered steel for the turn. Oh, so it's very exciting. The actual turn knives are at Niagara right now in steel form going onto a Blanchard grinder to be ground and descaled with the Blanchard. Uh, just to so. nerd out, let's go back. Cause you started talking about this and I almost asked you to hit record. Okay. So normally you do not have steel Blanchard ground by Niagara. Correct. Okay. Uh, go into that process a little bit, just, just from the standpoint of like, how do you, how is steel usually coming to you? So I usually buy a sheet of steel, 24 inch by 36 inch, slightly okay. variable depending on how it was rolled. Yep. And it's rough because they roll it, they hot roll it like orange forge hot, run it through yep. rollers. And that's how they get it flat and even. And it leaves burn marks. It's like a charred piece of steel. So then they like either soda blast it or bl- sandblast it. They blast it with something to take that off, but it's rough. It has the texture of like leather. And so anybody that's ever held steel, I mean, the same as the steel you've got, you know, yep. any, any steel, um, and so it, that I would order it like that. I would have a water jet. I would have a surface ground, but surface grinding the mill scale off, which is like the rough remaining yep. texture is nasty. 
Yeah. It, it loads up the wheel on the surface grinder. It's really slow. It, you have to redress the wheel a lot. Um, it also has high spots because if the roller has like, let's say a little bump in it or something, yeah. it can make like a little high hill. And then if you have it water jet, you can have a knife that like teeter totters because Ooh. it's kind of sitting on like lumps and bumps. And so he's having, uh, Ron, the guy, my brother-in-law doing surface grinding, he'll have issues where like some of them, like the tip wants to pop up and it's like fluttering a little bit. So the finish is really bad. It's just, and so he's like hand sanding, trying to get him to lay flat on the surface grinder for the first pass. And I'm like, well, what if we blanchard ground like 75% of the thickness off Yep. At a, as a sheet? Because Blanchard is way yep. faster and more aggressive, but you can't hit the tight tolerances on dimension and you can't get the good finish that right. a surface grinder can. Right. So it's like a one, two punch now of most of it removed from the Blanchard water jet, then surface grind to finish. Yeah. Um, and it's not unique. I know a few people that do that and I think it's probably the way to go, but this is the yeah, first that's, one. That, again, that's just these small, small upgrades. Like yeah. that's pretty good. Dude, I'm yeah. so excited. So the term we haven't, is, even sh- we haven't showed the knife yet. That's a good good point. When are we going to do that? I don't know. We can talk about that. Yeah. I think uh, we should just make it, put it in a box, and then sell it. Put a quest, like Sight. a mystery yeah, box. Yeah, put, put a mystery yeah. box knife. Yep. Just put it. That would be fun. Sell it without ever announcing it. Yeah, sell it without ever showing it. <laughs> That'd be funny. <laughs> I would be willing to do that on like a, on like a small prototype run. Yeah. Pro- I don't know about on hundreds of knives. <laughs> That'd be a little crazy, <laughs> but, uh, all right. Uh, man. yeah, we should post it soon. Okay. Probably. All right. Cause it's, um, it's happening. Well, it'll be nice. Cause you'll have, you'll have like process stuff to post soon. Yeah. Yeah. Too. And, and I, I have talked on the pod before about like ship it or zip it, like waiting, yep. which is what I did on the sport. Yep. But, this one feels different because people are hearing right now all about yeah. it. It's, it's got a different hue to it. So yeah, I'm game to show it. Uh, yeah. That'd be cool. So, all right, man. Um, good chat guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, leave us a review, please. Yep. Um, send us questions. Yeah. Send us questions. We make really mistakes like and get yourself into trouble. Yep. Okay. Gotta do it. All right. Appreciate Talk it. Talk to y'all. you guys later. Bye. Bye.